Hello, we are going to start our journey here in Biology 101 with Chapter 1, which is really um, an overview of biology and all living things and how they are organized. Um, these are new PowerPoints for the biology department, um, just so that you are aware of how they are set up for you. Um, they are going to have all of the information that I am going to go through with you. And then at the end, there's this index um, of the pictures. I'm not going to go through those because as we go through the PowerPoint, I'm going to talk about the pictures and the information on each slide. That being said, um, as you are going through, if you um, decide to go through those final slides, um, then, then feel free. Um, and really, it's going to give us um, a really good overview um, of, of what we're going to go through with, with these slides as we're um, working through it. So without any further ado, let's take a look at chapter one. In chapter one, we're going to go through four different sections. These sections are going to um, include characteristics of life and evolution and classification, the science method or scientific method process of science, and then any sort of challenges that are facing science today. Um, and on the D2L are your objectives, but very generally, they are going to come from this outline where we are going to know the basic characteristics of life, describe terms relative to defining living things like energy and metabolism, DNA, natural selection. We're going to look at the biosphere and how it is organized, including atoms, molecules, tissues, cells, organs, the organ systems, organisms, populations, communities, and ecosystems. We are going to look at the levels of taxonomy, and then we're going to describe the domains and kingdoms very basically. That's more of a 102 standard, but we're going to know them in general. Um, and then what is the scientific method, including things like an observation, hypothesis, experiment, uh, collecting data, and then drawing conclusions. And then finally, summarizing the major um, issues that are affecting science today. And of course, that's not going to be all encompassing. We're um, able to think about other issues and uh, you probably know many facing science today. So let's take a look first at the characteristics of life. If we break down the word biology, Ology just means the study of something, and biology is the scientific study of living organisms or the scientific study of life. And there is an immense diversity among living things. We know living things just naming things around me. It's, you know, your cat, plants, insects, fish, um, people, anything you can probably think of um, that is alive is going to share some characteristics. So we're going to look at living things that are, um, as a whole, looking at their shared characters. So something is that living things are composed of the same chemical elements as non-living things. So we are going to use that periodic table that you learn about in chemistry to compose and make up living creatures. And of course, living things have to obey the same physical and chemical laws that govern the rest of the universe. They're not exempt from things like gravity or entropy, um, so physics type things. If we then look at some of this diversity of life, uh, we can see that we have things like bacteria, protists, like our single-celled paramecium. Here, um, our morel is a type of fungus or mushroom. Plants, 
like a sunflower, and animals like an octopus. So despite that diversity that we see, and despite the similarities in having to follow laws of physics and chemistry, um, we are going to be able to see some more shared characteristics that make living things living things. Um, and again, this is where if you want a much more detailed description of each of these pictures, you can click jump to the diversity long description, but I'm not going to go through those slides. They're just more info about these pictures and the photographers and how it relates. But anyway, let's take a look at some of these characters. The first characteristic is that living things are organized. Now that doesn't mean that your cat and dog are making checklists and staying on top of whatever their work might look like, like people are. What organized means is that we are going to have a very step-by-step -step way in which we arrange everything within an organism. There is going to be a chemical way we organize and then a biological way. So we're going to look at both, but the levels of biological organization are going to range from atoms, that's more of our chemical, and then all the way up to a biosphere. That's going to incorporate biology and chemistry um, within it. If we're looking at that biological organization, a cell is the basic unit of structure and function for all living things. A cell is the smallest living unit. So we say it is the structure and function. With that, there are organisms that are going to be alive and they are unicellular, meaning they have one cell. Or they could be multicellular, meaning that they have many cells, some have specialized, and then those specialized cells cannot live without the other cells. As we're going through these levels of organization, each one is more complex than the level below it. It's like a step up each time in this process. So as that biological complexity increases, each level of this organization has new properties. We call those emergent properties. They're new and then they belong to that category. First, we can start with an atom. An atom is the smallest unit of matter. So not alive, but is the smallest unit of matter. And we know within atoms, we have electrons that are negatively charged and protons that are positively charged and neutrons that are neutrally charged. Here in our example, oops, in our example, we have oxygen. It's arranged with a nucleus and then this cloud of electrons around it. If we step up to a slightly more complex, the next step in organization is a molecule. A molecule is the combination or the union of two or more atoms, and they could be of the same or of a different element. When we talk about a compound, a compound is a type of molecule that is going to have different elements. So our atom again, that is the smallest unit of matter. If we have all the same type of atoms in a sample, that is an element. If we have different atoms coming together, combining, bonding, we make a molecule. The example here is one carbon with four hydrogens making methane. 
if we then step up again in organization, we're going to combine a bunch of molecules together. We may even call some of those bigger molecules macro molecules. Macro meaning big, not you can visualize it or see it. Um, and with those molecules all combining, we can make a cell. This is the first biological level of organization. Before that, our atom and molecule, that's all chemical. But once we reach cells, we now have living things. And a cell is going to just be a combination of many molecules all working together. We can then step up another rung of our ladder of organization and we can make a tissue. A tissue is going to be a group of cells that will have a common structure and common function. So they will all work together. An example here for our cells, for animal cells, we have a nerve cell. For our tissue, if we have a bunch of nerve cells that work together, that will make nervous tissue. If we step up again, we can make an organ. An organ is going to be composed of two or more tissues that will work together to do a specific task. For example, we have nervous tissue. If we also combine that with vascular tissue, like your blood vessels, um, with fat tissue, um, or adipose tissue, um, we can then make your brain. Um, for our plant side here, we've got a plant cell making leaf tissue that then combines with epithelial tissue and vascular tissue, xylem and phloem, to make leaves. We can go up another step and have organ systems. So if we have more than one organ working together to do a function, that makes an organ system. For this brain, uh, if we also add the spinal cord, that makes your nervous system. Um, for our plant, that's something like combining the leaf and the branch uh, to make that shoot system. If we combine multiple organ systems together, we have an organism. That is one single individual thing uh, that is going to have many interworking, um, interrelated organ systems. An example, your elephant or a tree. From that, uh, we can even add more to this level of organization. From an organism, we can group that organism as a species. That is going to be a group of similar interbreeding organisms, meaning that they share characteristics, they reproduce with each other, and those offspring that they've created will be able to reproduce. If we have a species all living together in one place, in a particular area or space, then that could be a population. So it's all of the same species living together in one area at one time. That's your population. If we then look at um, the animals that, uh, that are living among or around our population and include them, that is going to be a community. So it's any interacting populations. For example, in our picture here, we're going to have this group of elephants, a group of zebras, and all the trees around them. Those are all going to be populations that are going to interact, live, and work 
in the same space. After that, we have an ecosystem. An ecosystem is going to be a community plus any of the physical environment characteristics. You may also hear abiotic factors, things like sunlight, water, uh, soil composition. All of that is going to be part of the ecosystem. So it's the animals, it's the plants, it's the characteristics of the environment that they are in. That is an ecosystem. And then finally, we have biosphere. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to read on this picture, but a biosphere is just going to be the regions on Earth that share the same types of ecosystems. When you were in probably grade school or middle school, you may have learned about things like tundras or deserts. Um, those are going to be these um, areas on the map that are going to have um, shared characteristics. And then when we look at them as a whole, then we are able to have our biosphere because we'll have these different ecosystems that are all going to work together. For our purposes here, our biosphere is going to be the planet Earth. As you can see from even this picture, as you move up each level of organization, you're going to get a larger item and you're going to have more characteristics starting down here with atoms to molecules to cells to tissues to organs organ systems organisms species populations communities ecosystems and biospheres so that is all um all living things have this kind of organization. You could pick for just a thought experiment for your notes, any organism that is alive that you can think of and try to place where this is. So my cat is in front of me, maybe I pick my cat and I try to figure out where in this um, level of organization, I can I can organize him. Uh, he has atoms, he has molecules, he definitely has cells and organs um, and organ systems. He's an organism. If I looked at his species, domesticated house cats, then I could see what is his population. Well, currently he's not hanging out with really any other cats, um, but maybe his population becomes my family. Um, and then his community, and, and so on and so on. So again, vocab words, how is this biosphere organized? You have the biosphere, which is going to be the air, the land, the water, everything about where that organism exists um, and how it's all interconnected. So that's our planet Earth. How that tundra is connected to mountains, connected to deserts, to the ocean, all of that. Then you'll have an ecosystem, which is going to be that community of animals that are all living together in a place, plus those physical constraints, the space, the soil, the air, the water. A community is going to be these interacting populations in that same space. A population is all the members of a species in a place. And a species is this group of similar interbreeding organisms. And then an organism is when you have organ systems that work together. Organs, um, again, will be made up of tissues and then those tissues are made up of cells. Cells are made of molecules. Molecules are going to be made up of atoms and atoms are our lowest level of organization or the organization where all matter is going to begin. 
So now we know that our first characteristic of life is that life is organized. Our second characteristic of life is that life requires materials and energy. Energy is the capacity or the ability to do work. And energy is required to maintain that organization. Everything is wanting to go to chaos. Um, and so we need energy to prevent that. Um, and energy is required to have life-sustaining processes like chemical reactions. Metabolism is a word you may have heard to describe these chemical reactions. Metabolism is just all the chemical reactions that occur in a cell, which we know cells make up tissues, then organs, then the organism. So again, energy is required for life to happen. The sun is the ultimate source of energy for really every life on earth, or at least most of it. Uh, plants, algae, and some other smaller organisms are able to capture that solar energy and do photosynthesis. So that is how they are making their own food. And photosynthesis is just this process that takes solar energy and turns it into chemical energy by making glucose, which is a carbohydrate. Ecosystems um, are going to be characterized by how they are able to have that energy flow from one place and one organism to another. And we call that chemical cycling and energy flow. So chemicals are not used up or destroyed when organisms die. They are just moved to another organism or another population. Um, for example, um, you have a tree that is growing, that tree gets hit by lightning, falls over, and is now dead, well, there's going to be decomposers that will break that tree down and put nutrients into the soil. So we're not going to lose these chemicals. We're just going to move them. Um, and so, yeah, can, uh, chemicals move from the producers, that tree produces energy from the sun, to consumers, so an animal that eats the plant, and then to the decomposers, the fungus, the bacteria, the insects that break it down. Um, and then those chemicals are returned back into the soil and can be used by new living plants. Energy from the sun flows through plants and other members of the food chain, and then that one population uh, will feed on another, on another, on another. So there must be this constant input of solar energy to these plants so that they can make sugar, so that animals can eat the plants and get energy, and then animals can eat the animals that ate plants and get their energy. So here's what we just saw in word form in a picture that I think is maybe a little bit easier to understand that. Um, you've got the sun and it's shining down on earth and then we have what we call producers. In this picture it's going to be this grass um, that is producing energy from the sun. It's taking in sunlight, it's making sugar. Some of that energy is going to be lost as heat. Think about when you work out or even try to just walk upstairs and you're tired, um, you get hot and sweaty. Plants don't sweat, but some of that energy is going to be lost to the environment as heat. Then we're going to have an animal that will eat or consume the producers. In our picture here, it's this rabbit. It is going to consume the producer. It is going to get some of this energy 
but it's also going to lose energy as heat. Then we can have a secondary consumer, something like this hawk that eats the rabbit. That is also a consumer. When it consumes the rabbit, it's going to get some of that energy that it had all the way back from the sun, but it will lose some as heat. That dead bunny carcass is on the ground and we'll have things like mushrooms there to decompose and break down. It will add the chemicals back into the soil for the plants to then take up. Um, so that fungus is getting some of that energy from decomposing that dead rabbit, but it also loses some of the energy as heat. Every step in this nutrient cycling, we are losing some of the energy to the environment. And then there's always going to be less energy than what we started with. We have a lot of energy from the sun. Producers take it in, but lose some. Consumers get that energy from the plants, but some of it is lost. Decomposers get it from dead stuff, but some of that energy is lost. But the entire purpose is to take these chemicals and recycle them in the ecosystem. If we also look at our characteristics of life, um, we said now that it's organized, that it requires energy um, and has metabolism, but now we have that living things maintain homeostasis or a balance. So homeostasis is the maintenance of internal conditions within certain boundaries. What that means in normal speak is that your body and the body of every living thing has certain conditions that have to be met and your organ systems regulate that. Great example, if you take your body temperature right now, it's going to be somewhere about 98.6 degrees. If you get cold, your body will start to shiver so that you warm up. If you're too hot, your body will start to sweat so that you cool down. That is maintaining those conditions. If you were to get way too cold, hypothermia, you could die. If you were to get way, way too hot, heat exhaustion, you could die. So your body has to maintain that internal balance. Um, and it's imperative that all organisms maintain that range for whatever they are. So some animals are cold-blooded. They alter their position to change their body temperature. Um, some are have warmer body temperatures. Some of them, the body temperature doesn't matter as much. It might be the chemicals that are in their blood that are a much more important thing um, to monitor. And so they'll have hormones to help monitor blood glucose, et cetera, et cetera. There's more than one um, thing in balance in our bodies. And we have these feedback systems. Basically, you get information from your conditions around you and in your body that will then help to make adjustments. So you eat a meal, you have a lot of blood glucose, um, you will um, secrete insulin to break it down. You are feeling hungry, uh, then you will secrete um, thyroid hormone um, so that your body has this idea that it needs to eat food, etc. Okay, so now we know life is organized, life needs energy, life maintains a balance. Living things also must respond to stimuli. Stimuli is just anything in their environment that they interact with and respond to changes to. So a lot of times that is a ability to respond um, and 
and move. So one example of a stimuli, you reach on your stove and touch a pot that is hot, you are able to move your hand away. Some animals are photosensitive. They like to be in the sun or they like to be away from the sun. So they can move uh, to, to get sun or get away from it. I think of my plants. Um, if I put them in a window in my bedroom, they sort of start to grow towards where the light is. If I don't turn them or put them in a different window, they kind of lean over. That is a response to stimuli. So now we know living things are organized, living things need energy, living things maintain a balance, living things respond to stimuli, living things are also able to develop and then reproduce. So all living organisms have to reproduce in order to maintain their population. The manner of reproduction will vary depending on the organisms. Some reproduce asexually, some will reproduce sexually, some can do both. Um, and then when these organisms reproduce, the main thing they are doing is passing on their genetic information, we call those genes, they're coded on the DNA, to the next generation. Genes are going to be what determines the characteristics of an organism. And genes are going to be coded for on DNA. And DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. This deoxyribose nucleic acid is found in the nucleus of all of your cells. So life is organized. Life needs energy, life maintains a balance, um, life um, reproduces, life responds to stimuli, life or living things have adaptations. An adaptation is just any modification that makes the organism better able to live in its particular environment. There is a great diversity of life that exists over many, many years, long periods of time. Um, and our Earth um, is something like 13.6 billion years, or our universe is 13.6 billion years old. Our Earth is like 4.6 billion years old. We've had living things on our planet for a very long time. Um, and they're able to continue to live on this planet because they can respond to changing environments and new adaptations develop as environments change. Evolution is just the change in the population of organisms over time. So I know sometimes evolution is sort of a buzzword. It's a little bit of a scary word, but if you think about what it is on a biological level, it does really make sense because nothing stays static in an environment. It's always responding and changing to be better suited for the environment. And if we throw in, um, you know, geologic time, Organisms change, populations change, and that is evolution. And then uh, here is just a fun little photo of some penguins living on um, this little ice flow uh, in the Antarctic. Um, Sorry to burst anyone's Coca-Cola commercial dreams, uh, but penguins live in the Southern Hemisphere. They don't live uh, in the Arctic, so they don't live where there are polar bears. Um, so this is from your textbook, really just trying to show um, that we have these um, organisms that have developed over time. So birds we know fly, but um, penguins, they don't fly, they swim. That's an adaptation. 
and that is part of their evolutionary history. Um, and then this sliding on the ice to move quickly on land is also an adaptation um, that conserves energy and allows them to adapt to this icy environment that they live in. All right, so that's everything that we need about classifying life. Now we're going to look more into, uh, or I guess everything that we just did was all on organization of life. And now we're going to look a little bit more into now that we know the characteristics and organization of living things, how do we classify them? So our theory of evolution explains that there is a diversity of life and that there are shared characters of life. And this theory of evolution suggests how living things descended from their common ancestor. And the term that is used or coined for this was common descent with modification. We know that there was a last universal common ancestor for all living things um, because we can look at DNA or just genetic material in general and see that all living things have DNA and RNA and the same nucleotides. So that isn't just by random chance. It makes more sense that there was some unifying common ancestor that all living things shared, you know, billions, millions of years ago. And then it descended, there was more um, organisms through reproduction and that modifications, adaptations to environments occurred. With that, the most famous theory is natural selection. That's one evolutionary mechanism or one way that evolution happens. It was proposed by Charles Darwin. That being said, you can't think of Darwin without also thinking of Wallace. Um, he really thought of this natural selection theory of evolution stuff pretty much around the same time. Uh, so Darwin kind of borrowed without permission some of his ideas um, and published first. And so he published first, so he's the one who discovered it and is the most famous. But don't forget about Wallace when you think of Darwin. Um, with that, though, Charles Darwin, really his entire um, origin of species, there are some great parts and there are some problematic parts, but one of these great parts is this natural selection. What it says is that in the environment, there are conditions in which certain characteristics benefit an organism. If it benefits the organism, it will be more likely to reproduce. Those favorable traits will then be passed on and it will increase in the population over time. So for example, if you have some birds liking to eat brown colored insects, uh, but there is a, a insect of the same species that is green when it's born, it's able to hide. Um, well then over time, being green in color is favorable. The birds will eat the brown insect, the green insect will survive, reproduce, and over time, the population will change from being brown insects with a few green ones to being green with a few brown ones. How do we get this change in the population? Um, there's many ways, but one of them is mutations or a change in the DNA. That is a fuel for natural selection. It introduces variation brown bug versus green bug, or whatever it might be. And then with those um, mutations, those changes, the environment selects which of those organisms is going to be best able to survive. 
Um, here is an example in picture form of a deer. So some plants in this population have smooth leaves, some have spiky leaves. The deer will eat the plant that has smooth leaves. That's easy for them to eat. And they'll avoid the spiky leaf because the spiky leaf doesn't taste good. It's prickly. The deer don't want to eat it. Over time, having that prickly leaf is going to be a favorable trait. So that plant with the prickly leaf is more likely to survive and reproduce. Over time, we have more prickly leaves in our population and less smooth leaves in the population. And then many, many generations later, we may not have any smooth leaves left in our population. And then we know that um, evolution has taken place um, by the mechanism of natural selection. The deer eating the plant is part of that environment. The response, the mutation, whatever it is that caused it to have spiky leaves is favored. So it survives and reproduces. All right, so now that we know that there's this great diversity of living things and we know that um, natural selection is one way to get that great diversity, we want to organize it because as you can imagine, there's many, many living things on Earth and just naming them willy-nilly would be um, not good for anyone or just referring to them as their common names would not be very good um, if we're all trying to study these living things. So taxonomy is the part of biology that identifies names and classifies organisms according to certain rules. There's systematics, which is going to be the study of evolutionary relationships between organisms. Both of these fields of biology um, always, always need people uh, to be a part of them. Um, they, unsurprisingly, are not always the most popular fields of biology. Some people think it's kind of boring, um, but it is how we name things and how those things we've named are related to one another. In order to classify them, we are going to make some categories from the least inclusive, so that's like the smallest um, category, to the most inclusive, the biggest category. We have species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, domain. I personally like to flip that order and use the mnemonic device, did King Philip come over for grape soda? Domain, did. Kingdom, king, phylum, philip, class, come, order, over, family, for, genus, grape, species, soda. So I like to take my little triangle that they describe here as species at the very apex, the tip, um, and then getting wider down to domain and flip it like a funnel and use did King Philip come over for grape soda, but please feel free to... Um, Use whatever works best for your brain. As we look at these categories, um, there is going to be more types of organisms in each of these categories as you go from species to domain. Or if you use my method, domain to species, you're funneling down to the one individual organism when you reach species. So let's take a look then. This is a table that comes out of your textbook. Um, if it helps you to organize it this way as well, feel free. Um, if we look, we have our category on the far left and then this is giving you the taxonomy classification for humans and then for corn. So we see in domain, the biggest category, um, we have eukarya, and eukarya. That is for the types of cells. You can have a eukaryotic cell, which is a cell that has organelles, or you can have um, a prokaryotic cell that is without membrane-bound organelles. 
And so we see here at our largest category, humans and corn have the same um, taxonomy. Obviously, humans and corn are not the same organism, so we need to get more refined. Next comes kingdom. We have humans are in animalia and plants, or corn is in plantae, or for plants. So we see our first split between humans and corn coming in kingdom, kingdom animal, or kingdom plant. Then we have phylums. Humans are in phylum chordata, meaning we have a backbone. Uh, corn is in anthophyta, meaning that it has flowers um, as it grows. Then you have class, mammal, meaning that humans are mammals. We are warm-blooded. We have milk. We have hair. Uh, corn is in monocotyledonae, which is saying that it has one seed leaf. Um, but there are lots of organisms that are mammals, for example, and lots of plants that when they grow have one sprouting leaf. So we need to get even more uh, specific. We have order. Humans are in the order primates. Corn is in commelinales. Then we've got a family making it even more specific, hominidae and posia. Then we have our genus, genus homo, genus zia, and then the species. In order to name an organism as that specific organism, you use what is called a binomial name or the scientific name. And with that, you use the genus and the species. So it's called the specific epithet when you are within taxonomy. So genus specific epithet or genus species in order to name that animal or that organism. So humans, we are Homo sapiens. Corn is the Amias. If we then walk through each of these character or each of these classification in taxonomy um, groupings, we'll see that there are some things that are the same and there are some things that um, are different at each um, category level, right? There's going to be um, it becoming more specific as we go from domain to species. And we're going to be excluding organisms as we go from the domain to the species. So what are the domains? Because um, if that is one of our first categories, then there has to be more than one. So there is domain archaea. Domain archaea includes unicellular, one cell, prokaryotes, their cells do not have membrane organelles, that usually live in extreme environments, but probably uh, are very similar to what our early Earth was like. So archaea are going to be these extremophiles, things that live in super salty water, at hydrothermal vents, and really, really hot, um, like hot, hot springs. Um, they use sulfur instead of carbon base for their metabolism. Um, they're these extremophiles. Then there's domain bacteria. That's going to be unicellular prokaryotes that live in all environments, including in and on human beings. Um, you're probably familiar with bacteria if you've ever had like strep throat or a staph infection or um, sometimes even a sinus infection. Really, all sorts of illnesses are caused by bacteria. And then there is domain eukarya, which is going to contain unicellular and multicellular uh, eukaryotes. And a eukaryote just means that it has uh, membrane-bound organelles in it. Um, specifically, it has a nucleus. It has 
Golgi bodies, endoplasmic reticulum, etc. Here is an example of archaea. Again, they're prokaryotic cells. They come in a lot of different shapes. They can live in super extreme environments. They can absorb food. They can absorb sunlight. They can absorb chemicals. So very uh, multiple ways of nutrition. And they do have some very unique uh, chemical characteristics, one of them being um, that they arrange their genetic material, their DNA, in a way similar to animal cells. They wrap it up in proteins called histones. Um, and other uh, single-celled prokaryotes do not do that, which is why one of the reasons they became their own domain. They used to be lumped with bacteria as domain prokaryote, but they are different. Then we have domain bacteria. This is going to be our prokaryotic cells of all kinds of shapes, little rod shapes, circle shapes, spiral shapes. Some are bigger, some are smaller, all sorts of ways. Uh, they can live really all over the place, soil, internally, um, air, um, plants, uh, all over. They uh, can absorb to get nutrients. They can do photosynthesis, some of them, uh, or they can use chemicals to get their food. And they also have some unique um, chemical characteristics that make them separate from archaea. And then within domain eukarya, we actually have four kingdoms. We have a uh, kingdom protist or protista. That's going to include things like algae, slime molds, water molds, um, amoebas, paramecians. Um, as a whole, those are called protozoans. They can be single celled, they can be more than one cell, multicellular, they can be colonial, they can absorb food, photosynthesize, ingest food. True and honest kingdom protista is like a junk drawer category. It's a little bit of, of all kinds of characteristics. So much so that they add a, another level of taxonomy that we don't speak about in Bio 101 called a supergroup because they're so diverse and they don't fit anywhere else. They just fit into kingdom protist. Then um, a more straightforward group in domain eukarya is kingdom fungi. It's going to be things like molds, mushroom, yeast, ringworm. Um, they're going to have multicellular forms with specialized cells, and they are absorbers or absorbative heterotrophs. They eat food that they absorb outside of their body. That's how they break down dead stuff. Then kingdom plantae, that's going to have uh, mosses, ferns, pine trees, and other conifers and flowering plants. They are going to be multicellular, have special tissues, um, and they will photosynthesize to make their food. Then there's going to be kingdom animalia. That's going to be um, periphera or sponges, worms, insects, fish, frog, turtles, birds, mammals. Um, really anything you can think of that is not a plant, not a fungus, and not some kind of bacteria is probably going to be an animalia. Um, they are going to have specialized tissues, be multicellular, be modal at some point in their life, and then they are able to ingest food to get their energy. If we look then at kingdoms, um, domain archaea, their kingdom right now is just archaea. Their domain archaea, kingdom archaea, because they are still being determined if there are kingdoms within archaea. Um, a little bit of just fun science history background. Domain archaea became its own thing in really the 1970s. 
which may feel like a long time ago, but in science time, that's not that long. Uh, then domain bacteria. There are some designations, but a lot of them are still being determined. So for our purpose, they're being researched. And then again, domain eukarya, we do have designated kingdoms, um, but new supergroups are being determined. Um, and again, protus really is this junk drawer category. But we've got protista with our supergroups, fungus, plantae, and animalia. Knowing now that we have this way to organize our living creatures into categories from the most general characteristics to the most specific, um, we want to talk about scientific names for a minute here. Um, they are universally used around the world. Most of them are Latin based. There is some Greek based and some other language influence, but as a whole, they are Latin based. And there is something called binomial nomenclature, which means that it's a two part name. The first word is going to be the genus. We capitalize the genus. And the second word is the species uh, designation or specific epithet. It's the word we use for its species. Uh, and we write that in lowercase. Both of these can be italicized. If you are writing it on paper, you underline it. Um, some examples are Homo sapiens, are humans. You can see the Homo is uppercase and the S in sapiens is all lowercase and it is italicized. If I were writing it on paper, I would underline. Um, and same thing with Zia Mayas. So Zia, capital Z, May is um, lowercase m, and it's italicized. If I were handwriting it, I underline. All right. And then that leads us now into now that we know about living things and how we classify them and how they're organized into the process of science. Some of this may be review to you. Um, some of this may expand on what you already know. Uh, and some of this might be new, just depends on your educational background. And all of that is perfect where you're at. Um, so this diagram is giving us what is really the process of science. I will step to give a sidebar here that when I was learning science, I was taught the scientific method as make a hypothesis, do my experiment, get my data, make my conclusions, and then I'm done. Life is good. As I became a scientist um, through college and through actually doing scientific research, that is a great base model, <laughs> um, but no, because <laughs> you are going to make observations, you're going to do these experiments and make conclusions, but you're going to always end up with more questions and more reasons why you think something happens, so you will always have more fuel for more experiments. And that's some of the beauty and creativity of science that sometimes is missed. So this diagram is a little bit more what science is like. You make an observation. There are several different reasons you think things are the way that you saw them or observed them. So you make your guess. You design your experiment. And you know what? That doesn't really work out. So then you've got to go back and try again. And you will do your experiment. And maybe that one doesn't work out. And so you try again. Um, and then, okay, I have done my predictions. I've done my experiments. Some of this has confirmed what I thought. And then I can draw conclusions. If I'm not getting what I see, in my observations, if I'm not getting my expected outcome, then I just keep modifying and going back and back and doing more and more experiments, asking more and more questions, 
in order to to pull out and figure out what is happening until I reach my conclusions. So science, it's not linear as many people like to think it is. It doesn't give us a definite right and wrong answer. There really is a lot of creativity and um, trial and error in the process. With that, the scientific method is this series of steps that is used to gain scientific knowledge. And because it has these series of steps, we can trust that what is found is going to be what is happening and, and explaining um, a phenomenon in, in the world, in the environment. So what are the steps? We can really break them down into five steps. You make an observation. So you use any of your five senses and just observe the world. I encourage you right now to sit outside uh, and just see the world and, and ask questions and make observations. And then there's the hypothesis. That's your predicted, educated guess as to why something is the way it is. Then you will design an experiment and do the experiment in order to try to test if your hypothesis about why something is the way it is, is correct. And then you collect the data from your experiment and then you draw conclusions. So let's start with this observation. Observation is just using your senses to gather information about a phenomenon or a natural event. So something has happened. Um, I will tell you, if you have little kids or you know kids, they are natural scientists. What question do they ask one bajillion times a day? Why? 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 They are great at observing their natural world and asking why. And that's the first step. Seeing something that happens and questioning it. From that, you can make a hypothesis. That's this tentative explanation. For example, um, in early like elementary science, you may have learned to write an if-then statement. And if that is still the place you are at, like if I do this, then this thing happens, that's wonderful. I'm going to encourage you to push beyond and have an if-then because. If I do this, then this happens because blah, blah, blah. And eventually, you can push yourself to a point where you are giving this explanation without, if I do this, then this happens because, and you just give an explanation for what you observed. Um, actually, a really good example is the discovery for penicillin by Alexander Fleming in the 1920s. He was accidentally really discovering that this fungus growing on an orange could stop bacteria. Uh, and he really just, just kind of tested it out and put some of that fungus um, on a plate of bacteria and watched what happened. Um, and then had to make these um, observation or um, hypotheses as to why, what, what part of that was working. Um, and when we do this hypothesis, we develop it through something called inductive reasoning. And that is part of that if then because statement. Inductive reasoning instead of deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is sort of this um, like, um, like this process of starting with a piece of information you know is true. Like humans are mortal. Therefore, I am mortal, whereas inductive reasoning is kind of the opposite, where you see something happening and you have to backtrack to explain. So that is how you get your hypothesis. And then the most important part of this is that a hypothesis is testable. Um, you can have fantastic ideas about why something is happening the way it is in the natural world, 
but be unable to test it for many reasons. One being funding, two being technology. So you have to come up with a hypothesis that can be tested um, within the limits that you have, um, which is which is again part of that creativity of science. Uh, then you can make some predictions and do your experiment. An experiment is just this series of procedures, step by step, that is designed to test your hypothesis. Again, it's going to utilize these deductive reasoning skills in order to predict an expected outcome. So you see something in the world, you want to test why it's happening, and your goal is to reproduce what you saw. So you have this conclusion of whatever it might be. Uh, maybe you see a bird eating a certain kind of seed. And so your goal is to see why does it eat that seed and not other seeds. So you want your experiment to get to the bird eats only that type of seed. So you have to backtrack your experiment to design it so you get your outcome. Um, and the manner in which you conduct this experiment is called the experimental design. When you have a valid or good experimental design, it ensures that what you are examining is just a specific factor. There's not all of this noise. Um, you're looking at just one variable called the independent variable. Think independent starts with the letter I, I change it. So independent, I change it. It is the thing that you are testing. Of course, there can be a test group. Test group is just any of the things that you expose to the experimental variable. And a control group goes through all of the parts of the experiment, but they do not get exposed to the experimental group. The goal is to compare the results of your control group with your results of your test group, and there should be a difference. Something should have happened with your test group, and nothing happens with your control group. And of course, the data are the results of that experiment. And the results should be something that you observe, and you should observe them objectively. Um, they're usually um, a mix of qualitative, what you actually see and feel, smell, touch, visible to you, and then quantitative, numerical, things you measure. With data, um, you should organize it into tables or graphs or other um, I guess, um, visual organized um, objects. Data is also analyzed using statistics. In lab, you'll do some very, very basic statistics, but guess what? You know what does the statistics? Your calculator or Excel. You don't have to know formulas. You just have to apply them using, again, the calculator, Excel, not your brain. Um, and then data can also measure the variation around what you've collected or what you saw. Um, there's something called standard error, which error, which is how far from the average the data is. Um, you probably heard of standard deviation. So that's like a step further than standard error. Um, and it's showing you how close your data collection numbers were to each other um, or how far apart they were. So how much um, confidence do you have in, in being able to reproduce what you saw? In general, having measurements or time increments or whatever your data is that are all clustered closer together for your experiment is, is usually a good sign. Um, that your data is very accurate um, and truly representative of what you are looking at. And then there is statistical significance, 
we measure something called a probability value or a p-value. Um, if you've been with science stuff for a while or, or statistics, you maybe had a p-value chart. Um, we will not be using p-value charts. That will, again, be something that is calculated, that you're not calculating. Um, Excel does it for you and gives you your p-value. Um, but um, when we look at p-values, um, usually the scientific standard is a p-value of 0 0.05 or less, meaning that when I did the experiment, 5% or less of the time, um, my results are random chance. For some medical studies, that acceptable p-value can be 0.01, 1% of when I did this is random chance. So the lower your p-value, the greater the confidence you can have in your results. Um, and this is really the, the standard in which scientific data um, that's published in scientific journals is held to. We need to have a p-value of 0.05 or for medical stuff, usually 0.01 or less. And it's just saying that what happened wasn't random chance. It's because of my experimental design, I have discovered or I have confirmed that my hypothesis is correct. I'm explaining what happened with my experiment. Here is an example of a graph um, with blood uh, cholesterol levels. And we can see this is our uh, Y axis. Y, I like to think of it as a taller letter with that long arm. So it's the long axis. And then X is my short stubby axis. Uh, so it's the length axis. Um, on our X axis, we usually put our independent variable. Um, it's, it's the thing that we have changed and that we are um, controlling. And then the Y is the response or um, what we call our responding variable or dependent variable. So we can see here we had people getting their blood uh, cholesterol lever levels measured week one, two, three, and four. And what are those levels? How did it respond is on my Y axis. I can put a dot at the level they had. We connect it in this um, line graph and that's our data. And then we can see these little bars. That's gonna be our standard error or in some cases standard deviation. That's gonna show us how close to this um, measurement all of our samples really were. And what it looks like here is for week one, we had this um, measurement of all of our data. Maybe we measured, I don't know, 500 people. And this is the average blood cholesterol for week one for all of those people. We can see that some amount of people had a lower and some amount of people had higher. That's really our error here. How close were all of our measurements to one another? Um, so that is how we can show and represent our data um, as we do our experiment. Then of course we make a conclusion. This is the data being interpreted to determine if our hypothesis was supported or not. If the prediction that we made is what happens, if we see what we thought in our hypothesis being the results, then we say our hypothesis is supported. And if not, we reject our hypothesis. Um, and that isn't the end. That is just now we've got to go back. Um, even if we support our hypothesis, maybe there are things that we thought of now that we have to go back and we have to test again or differently to find our results. Um, how do you report these findings? There's many, many ways 
in which this scientific data gets out into the community. There are infographics, there's podcasts, there's webcasts, there's, um, you know, TV shows, all kinds of things. But the most well respected is the scientific journal. And there's scientific journals for really all kinds of fields of science. Um, some are very specific, um, like, you know, there's the Journal of Applied Medicine. There is sometimes just like Journal of, I don't know, like Entomology of Beetles. Um, and then they can be more broad, like, um, I don't know, there's just like Journal of Biological Science. Um, but that is where you're going to publish these findings. Oftentimes, to get these articles published in these respected journals, there's going to be peer review. So there will be other scientists that will read your work, look at your data, and ask questions about why you did things the way you did them. And, and it can be a little scary, but it's also just a way to ensure that the scientific process is being upheld. Um, and usually this process comes through where you may be asked for some revisions or ask some questions about your data, um, but then they accept your article and then it's published. Um, and part of this process is that when you send it to a journal, there are gonna be other scientists that can look at your work as a starting point or supplementing their work in and try to attempt to duplicate um, your work so they can um, use it for that or they can use it to dispel your work and say actually what I found is the opposite of what they found. So the process of peer reviewing and, and going through these journals just is there to make the process of science better and to make it um, as accurate and reputable as possible. Um, and here's just some examples of different journals. Um, there are many, many, many journals. So if you are interested in a field of biology, the Trident Tech Library has tons of these. Most of them these days are digital. You don't have to get the actual physical magazine or paper. Um, a lot of them are free. Some of them come with a paywall, so you have to pay to get them, um, which we're about to talk about uh, issues in science. And, you know, if you're interested, that's a debate definitely worth having in the access of information. Um, but yeah, journals, cool, cool times. With our scientific method, there's some other vocab words we need to look at. There is scientific theory. That is just this concept that joins together um, some well supported and related hypothesis. So in normal English, people say something like, oh, I have a theory and it's a guess. It's more of a hypothesis or a prediction. In the scientific community, a theory is supported by a lot of observations, a lot of experiments, a lot of data, and it's all pointing to a conclusion. An example, uh, the theory of evolution, the theory of relativity. Um, there is a lot of data, a lot of scientists, and a lot of observation that point to these things being true. That doesn't mean that they can't be proven false with better research, better technology, other observations. It just means that the current scientific knowledge says this is the explanation that many of us are finding. Uh, and then there is a scientific principle or a scientific law, which is a bunch of theories that really all support the same thing. And it would be very difficult to challenge their validity at this point in time. Again, it is possible with new information, new technology. Um, 
that these things change. Science is dynamic, um, but a good example um, is the law of gravity. Every time you toss something into the air, it falls. Um, there's so, so much supporting gravity. So it would be hard to dispel it. That being said, maybe one day someone throws something in the air and it doesn't fall down. What has changed um, would be the first question, you know? Um, and again, some basic theories um, that we know of in biology. There's the cell theory, and that's that all organisms are made up of cells and new cells come from other cells. Theory of homeostasis, you've got to maintain this internal environment, and the theory of evolution. Um, interestingly enough, with these theories, sometimes throughout scientific history, uh, science has backed sort of the wrong theory, uh, one of those being that the Earth was the center of the solar system. That was highly, highly uh, thought of as truth. And it was, you know, Galileo that was like, hold up, not true. And then now we know the sun is the center of our solar system. So um, theories, well supported, but not absolute. Um, which is a, a good caveat that science is not perfect. We're limited in what we can know based on many things. Um, some more theories really, uh, or some how we get to a theory is you've got your hypothesis, like antibody B is better for treatment than antibody A. We do these experiments, we collect data, we collect more data, and so on and so on. And eventually, a lot of scientists are all saying the same thing. Then it is probably um, a, a truth that is worth um, elevating to a theory. All right, with experiments, again, you need a hypothesis. Um, here is this hypothesis that this newly discovered antibiotic is better than antibiotic A. You've got a control group where the subjects that have these stomach ulcers are untreated. And you've got a test group that is going to be treated with either antibiotic A or B. We can then get some results. We can do an endoscopy where doctors examine the linings. Um, and then they are going to do that for all of the people. And they can then do statistics to see the effectiveness of the treatments. And then based on the data, the investigators conclude their hypothesis is supported. Antibiotic A is better. All right. Last but not least in our adventure here is going to be challenges facing science. And again, these are what your book says. You are so very welcome to have a discussion um, amongst yourselves with me, anyone you can think of. There are probably many, many more challenges to science. But science is the systematic way of getting knowledge. Technology is the application of scientific knowledge and interests to humans. Um, so using technology, getting better technology makes better science. So we are limited in our technology. If I'm someone who wants to study Pluto, we can't go there. We can't even really get people to Mars at this point. So um, we're limited by that technology. Um, so yeah. Biodiversity and habitat loss is also a huge limit to science. Biodiversity is the total number and relative abundance of a species. And that is going to, of course, vary by e ecosystems naturally. Um, it is estimated that we've got at least 8.7 million species, but less than 2.3 million of those have been 
named and identified by science. And with habitat loss, um, for many reasons, for building things for people, um, for farming, for um, natural disasters, whatever it might be that loses habitat, there are species that we may never get to see um, because they will go extinct before they can be named and identified. Um, extinction is the death of the last member of a species or larger classification category. And it is estimated that we are losing hundreds of species every year due to human activities. Some slight good news in that is that there has been several pushes. Um, one notable one, the Endangered Species Act in the United States, Marine Mammal Protection Act, which actually um, kind of goes worldwide. There are some company or some countries that don't participate. Um, but some of these species are are being protected. People are realizing that they are valuable. Um, a great fun example here in North America on the coast, uh, sea turtles used to be harvested. Um, and their numbers were dwindling, uh, then include things like people building stuff on beach property. They have no nesting sites. Uh, oh my goodness, commercial fisheries, fishing them out of the ocean accidentally as bycatch. It was not good for sea turtles. They are considered endangered. Um, then we protect them here in South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, really the entire East Coast and Gulf uh, protects beaches for nesting turtles, protects turtles. It's illegal to harvest them, harvest their eggs, harass them. Uh, you keep your lights off beaches at night, et cetera, et cetera. And now we are seeing nesting numbers increase so much that loggerhead sea turtles um, are, are being considered to be being downgraded from um, critically endangered down to even just endangered or threatened, which means we've made strides. Um, bald eagles were having problems with their eggs because of DDT. Now there's regulations about that and we are seeing bald eagles and wood storks and other birds um, being able to recover in their populations. One little caveat to that is that it's usually these really large, really charismatic species that get attention, and we are losing many more species um, that aren't as big, cute, that don't get the love. Um, so forever, you know, use a paper straw, save a sea turtle, we're losing insects, we're losing plants, um, we're losing rodents. We're losing other animals that aren't as um, well loved and liked. Um, so that is an issue. Um, tropical rainforests and coral reefs are home to many, many organisms and they are incredibly impacted by human activities. Um, for example, a canopy in a tropical rainforest can support orchids, insects, monkeys, and many other organisms. They are cut down for farming land, for fuel, for using the um, space for human habitat, um, for palm oil, all sorts of things are, are affecting why tropical rainforests are being destroyed. Coral reefs are habitats for jellyfish, sponges, crabs, lobsters, turtles, eels, fish. Um, pollution is a huge issue um, for coral reefs. If algae and seaweed that use nutrients in the water overgrow the coral, then the coral will die. Um, boating is an issue. Humans going to coral reefs can be an issue. Your sunscreen has chemicals that will harm the corals. People walk on corals. Um, so these places are a huge resource, a huge hotspot for biodiversity. Um, and we've gotten a lot of plants and animals for medical purposes um, and just sustaining our environment from these locations. And, and they are threatened. 
Um, so yeah, destruction of these ecosystems isn't just we lose a coral reef, we lose a forest. It's not, oops, sorry, monkeys, you can't live here anymore. Um, humans depend on these ecosystems for food, for medicines, for materials. Um, in the United States, draining of wetlands in the Midwest made flooding very bad and every every few years the flooding is out of control um, along the Mississippi River. I grew up in the Midwest and Missouri just constantly <laughs> having to deal with that. Um, it ruins farmland. Um, it ruins um, cattle grazing areas and obviously it ruins people's property and is a threat to human health. Um, destruction in South American rainforest kills species and also decreases the ability for lumber. If we don't replant trees that we harvest down, we're going to run out. Of course, emerging diseases is also an interesting sidebar of this. Um, over the past decade, many new diseases um, Obviously, some listed here, these flus, H5N1, uh, H7N9, so swine flu is one of those, SARS, Ebola, COVID-19. Uh, where are they coming from? New and increased exposure to animals and insects, changes in behavior, uses of technology, Legionnaire's disease. Um, this actually got spread um, there are several cases of this through like air conditioning vents, like pumping it around and infecting more people. Um, globalization, the ability to move from one place to another quickly and easily. And then pathogens um, mutating and changing hosts. Um, and, and I will put into this climate change, if there is an animal or organism that used to be held back because the climate wasn't right in a location, but now those areas are warmer or colder or wetter or drier because of climate change, they can go there now and they can bring this new exposure um, and, and cause disease. And of course, climate change, that's any change to normal climate cycles. It's not weather. Weather changes all the time and can even change on a more long-term basis. Uh, but climate change is this change to normal Earth cycles. And um, most scientists can attribute climate change to human activities. Um, you may have heard of the 97% of scientists believe in climate change. That's 97% of scientists believe in human caused climate change. 100% of scientists believe that climate change is a thing. Um, that climate fluctuates from normal cycles. It's just how much of that is caused by us. Um, due to this imbalance of carbon cycling, um, is what is thought to be causing our current um, change in climate. Um, more carbon is being released than it is being removed by the burning of fossil fuels, the destruction of forest and replacement of farmlands. And then ultimately the ocean is a giant sink for carbon, um, but we've slowed down some of our currents from the warming we've already created. Um, so it's not overturning and absorbing that carbon. And as carbon dioxide increases temperature, this is global warming. And it's going to make this greenhouse effect where it's going to sort of be a feedback loop where it's gonna keep getting warmer. And it changes all of Earth's ecosystems. Not everywhere is going to get hotter some places may get drier, some places may get wetter, some places may experience more precipitation, whether that's snowfall or not. Um, it's just all a, a large scale change in the normal cycles of Earth. So that's chapter one. Um, this is, again, that appendix of the images that kind of give you the explanations I gave, but we're not going to go through those. Um, but that is for you, should you want 
deeper explanations. Um, but now what is probably your question. So now you should go through uh, the McGraw-Hill homework. Um, you should look at the study guides that are available for you on the D2L. And then um, be studying because you will have a quiz on the D2L um, that is going to cover this material. I want to thank you for watching. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to me. But otherwise, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.